I think it's I think it's on. I can't remember. It's on. All right. Hallelujah. Hey, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm sorry my wife Nancy's not here. She normally would come. I was trying to think of the first time I came to Grace and Bible Baptist Church. I'm pretty sure if I remember that I, it's, it's, there's a possibility I don't. But anyway, it was a 1957 Greyhound bus that we parked over in the old building out there in 1989. <laughs> Back then, I was 61 years old, and, uh, <laughs> and God's given me good health, and I'm grateful for it and everything. That's wonderful. But anyway, uh, that's amazing. I was trying to reflect on that, how many years I've known uh, this church. Of course, more than that, but just to be uh, a guest, uh, it's a blessing. And I'm thankful that Pastor Webster would uh, give me privilege to come. Uh, when we initially, I think, when we first started about me being here today, uh, he, wasn't, he was not aware he wasn't going to be here, but some things happen, and he gets to be a help down there at Kaufman, and so on. Anyway, I'm glad that he trusts me to preach when he's not here. And so, but tonight, I am preaching again. If you'll please come back tonight, we are, I am going to bring up something to vote on. <laughs> so, since he's not here, I thought maybe we could... Uh, Take care of some business. So, anyway. uh, in, the, in the foyer out there, I have a, there's a table out there, and I have one book on there. It's called Still a Baptist, Neither Angry Nor Ashamed. I'm almost certain that I had this book when I was here last time. I'm not positive. It's $15. My goal is every church I go to that every family gets one of these books and at least one person in the family would read it and tell the others about it or make them read it. There are so many people that they know we're Baptists. Okay, we're Baptists. But there are most people who have no idea of specifically why or why that would be important. I just came from a meeting I was in not too long ago, and a, a fellow that I met that I knew his dad, and his dad influenced me uh, for being a Baptist and so on, but now he's a pastor of a church, and I was talking about some difference that I had that uh, I said I'm, I'm uncomfortable with churches that just, that being a Baptist is not that big a deal, it doesn't matter, and he was being honest, he said, well, I just spent the last three years leading our church to take the name Baptist off. And I said, your dad is one of those reasons that I am a Baptist like I am. And he said, well, I would love, I hope we have some time that we can sit down and talk about it. And it didn't happen, but I sure wanted to stick my finger in his eye. <laughs> Maybe the Lord protected both of us. So anyway, I'm a Baptist on purpose. And it does make a difference. Uh, years ago, and I didn't invent this, but someone said, Things that are different are really not the same. Anyway, this book is back there, and I sure hope that you get one. Uh, there will be some ladies at the information table. If I got the names right, it's Debbie. It's either, I think it's Miss Sharon. But anyway, they have, uh, if you need change, I don't have a credit card thing, but I, I sure hope that you'll get one and read it. Some of you can speed read. You can read it this afternoon and come back and tell us all about it. That would be awesome. All right, uh, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do today. It's, it's a well-known place in the Bible, so Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> so for people that don't go to church, some people are aware of kind of a, a storyline in the passage. It's called the prodigal son. It's not the only thing in the passage, uh, and yet uh, this morning I uh, intend to try to open up the passage, and we will spend uh, the majority of our time on the prodigal son. And then uh, tonight, uh, I don't know if you have a habit to come back to church at night. Uh, you should. And so tonight, I think it's at 5 o'clock, and that we have evening service, and I hope that you'll come back. I'm going to talk about the prodigal's brother tonight, and uh, he's quite the interesting character. 
And here's why I would really, really implore you to come back tonight. Most of us in this room behave like the brother, not like the prodigal. All of us have prodigal in us, but when it comes down to it, because you, especially if you come tonight, now if you don't come tonight, you might be more prodigal. But if you come tonight, people that attend uh, the services, generally we're infected with the older brother. Um, so I hope you'll come back tonight and see uh, how that unveils itself. And so pro, uh, Luke chapter 15, if you're able, I'd ask you to stand with me, please. For now over 30 years, I've asked people to stand to give reverence and to give honor to the eternal, infallible, inerrant. It is the perfect, preserved Word of God. You're not giving honor to me, but boy, uh, I believe that the Bible doesn't require it, but I just think it's a good way to remind all of us to honor God's Word. So here we go, verse number 1 of Luke 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? In verse 8, either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? Verse 11, and a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. No man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough, to, bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Wow, it's quite the... But the parable that Jesus gave here, so I'd like to pray and see what the Lord has to speak to our hearts today. So would you, would you be willing, would you be willing to say, okay, God, my heart's door is open. I'm not going to keep it shut. My heart's door is open. I'm ready to hear what you have to say. Would you do that? Let me pray with you, please. Our great God, I sure love you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you so much that you love me, that you love us, and that you proved that you love us. Praise your name. Thank you for another Lord's Day opportunity that we have right now. Thank you. Thank you for health just to be able to be here. And God, I'm grateful for opportunity and privilege to preach again here at Grace and Bible Baptist Church. Thank you. So, Lord, I ask you to help me. Uh, give me unction and utterance power just to be able to get across your word and i pray that you would use your word in a mighty way for all of us for those that are not yet forgiven thank you that you're giving them another opportunity i pray they'd say yes for us that are forgiven remind us of where we've been and what you've done for us so lord i pray you'll be the one to get all the glory and all the honor so, Jesus, I want to say I really am excited. I'm looking forward to when I get to see you. And it's in your mighty and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, the chapter has been titled by some, The 
great lost and found chapter in the Bible, and it is appropriate. Uh, there are three, I call them paintings, three pictures that are displayed that Jesus uh, brings out to them, and so he, they are brought there by, of course, by vocabulary, by words, and uh, the first picture is a field and uh, a shepherd and uh, sheep. The second one is a, a house, just a home, and a lady and uh, pieces of money, coins. Then, of course, the last one's a father and a son that is lost. Verse 1 and 2 tell us why the paintings, the pictures came into existence. The religious elite, the super spiritual people, scribes and Pharisees, uh, they know that Jesus has been making a claim that he's some kind of representative of God and that he is like the, the Messiah, the Christ, who they've been waiting for. And uh, they don't believe him. They think that he's just some kind of charlatan, a liar, a deceiver. And, but they, they're paying attention because the, the populace is kind of gravitating toward Jesus. And so scribes and Pharisees are keeping an eye on him, and they're watching him, and they, they cannot believe if he really is the Messiah that he should know who they are. He should give them attention. He should be wanting to be with them. He should not be wanting to give it to sinners. The Bible uses the word publicans and sinners. Now, a publican in this scripture is someone who collects taxes. That's the surface meaning. But the word publican became used as a, like a byword. You, would, you could say it about anybody that's a lowlife, that's a thief, that's a scoundrel, Someone that's never collected taxes in their life, you can say, mm -hmm, publican. And that's how the word was used often. But it might be true that many tax collectors are publican like. Just saying. Uh, so they cannot believe that Jesus allowed the publicans and sinners to come close to him. But then he went beyond that. He's eating with them. Doesn't he know better? He just can't believe it. So here Jesus is accused of receiving sinners. Beyond that, he, 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 cares. he cares about them. He's having compassion on them. He's being concerned about a sinner. The Pharisee is jealous. What is, he, if, what is he doing giving time to them? He should be talking, looking at us. It's like, it's, like, it's like Jesus has taken publicans and sinners and made them just as important as they are. They are bent out of shape. They begin to murmur, complain, and bellyache about Jesus giving attention to these people. So that's the reason for the pictures. That's why Jesus tells the parable. He's expressing, he's showing them his attitude toward the unwashed, his attitude toward sinners. Jesus is trying to explain to them, this is why I'm doing this. Hmm. The three pictures, think about them with me. Oh, yeah, this, it's, they're lost. How was the sheep lost? He's in the flock. He's part of the flock anyway. And he just is not paying attention, and he just got his head down and not seeing where he's going, and all of a sudden, aimlessly, he's lost. 
It wasn't with malice. It wasn't with meanness. It wasn't with hate. He just was not paying attention and wandering around, and now the sheep is lost. Hmm. What about the coin? You know, the coin doesn't even realize it's lost. It has no consciousness, no awareness. It's unaware. No idea. Then the son. On purpose. Deliberate. A choice. I think it's fascinating, to, uh, at least to, you've got three different kind of lostnesses, aimless, unaware, uh, not paying attention, unaware, and then deliberate. But regardless, listen carefully, all three are just as lost. Whether you know it or not, whether you did it on purpose or not, or whether you're just wandering, inadvertent, aimlessly. They're all three lost. I think it's also at least something to point out since I'm the one preaching. I think it's also uh, interesting that the first two, the sheep and the coin, someone is looking for them. But the third one, someone's waiting. That's different in how these three pictures are presented. So here's the idea. The Pharisees are murmuring, they're complaining, and so on. Jesus is trying to, he sets up these three parables for them, and here's the idea. Look at verse 4. What man of you... Having a hundred sheep, if he lose one, doth they not leave the ninety and nine and go after that which is lost until he finds? Here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, 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 you would do the same if you care. If you don't care about the lost sheep, you wouldn't go. If you don't care about the coin, you wouldn't go. And if you're not interested in the sun, you wouldn't be waiting and looking. Wow. The whole job, the whole thing is about concern. It's about care. It's about compassion. If you love, if you care, that's the key. That's what this is all about. Caring, having a burden for that which is sinful. Publicans. Is everybody with me? That's what this is about, folks. Have, do you have a burden? You know, if you don't have a burden, there would be no reason to go look. Uh, maybe you're not getting it. He's trying to explain to them why he's hanging out with them and why he's going after them. He has a burden. So what makes a person have a burden? What would, what would put a burden on you? Well, wouldn't it be obvious that one of the reasons if you've got 100 sheep and one of them is missing is that you would have a burden because you were informed? You've got 10 pieces of money and you realize, whoa, one of them's gone. If you didn't realize it, then you wouldn't have a burden. Yeah. I, I, this is another reason, perhaps, to be aware of the burden. You've experienced it yourself. You've experienced being lost. Now, I already know I'm, I am a man, and us mans, we've never been lost. We know that. (laughs) 
Not that we can admit it in such a way. We're just still looking around. But if you've ever been in the condition that you were lost and you weren't sure how to get out, that is a little concern. It does bother you. So that's a potential way that you could have a burden that you've experienced at once yourself. Hmm. Another uh, thing is that you've been informed there's this lost thing going on and you realize you can do something about it. Us that have seen and paid attention to news and over the years is that if there's someone in a community, especially I would say in this community here, if there were some child that was lost at the river, at the lake or something, and you were within earshot, you would see a crowd of people coming hoping they could do something about it. It's just a normal reflex of people that have compassion and awareness that there's a need, and I can do something about it. I want to help. And if it's walking arms width apart across a field or through the woods, we want to help if at all possible. Can somebody say amen? Yeah. When the child is lost. Who suffers the most? The parent or the child? Isn't that something? I don't know, and I've, I cannot imagine in this room, perhaps, and there is, that there's somebody here by family member or by that you've experienced the loss of a child, the kidnap of a child. Just, I, just, I just can't picture it. I don't know why I would be berserk. Is everybody with me? All that the child would go through and all that, it would be horrendous. But us that are parents, <laughs> You can't imagine it unless you've done it. I don't know if you're getting this or not. Jesus is telling this group of religious guys, he's telling them, hey, 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 hey. God the Father, heaven is more interested in lost sinners, publicans and sinners. And heaven's heart aches. For those who are lost, can somebody say amen? Mercy. So I might as well go ahead and start it. Are there any lost people in this community? Just asking. Is everybody saved in Sherman? Denison, McKinney, Melissa. Is anybody hearing me? For many of us, everybody's not even saved in our own family. I'm just bringing it up. It's the message. Do you care? No, no, no. Are you burdened? Are you going, why is Pastor Webster trying to always get us to go out and tell people? Doesn't he know we got other stuff to do? Why is it such an issue at our church? Is anybody hearing me? I believe that if we would admit and understand that we are informed about how many thousands of people are around us all the time. They're around us every day and they're going to hell and you and I walk right by them and no burden, no care, no tears. What's wrong with that? Is anybody getting this? I'm not the one that preached the sermon. Jesus is. 
He said, hey, hey, the reason I'm out here is because they're lost. And you're acting like you're not informed. Okay, let's just do this one. You're acting like you've never been lost. Don't you remember your sin? Don't you remember what he delivered you from? Don't you have an idea that you're not going to hell anymore? You're on your way to heaven. You're going to live as long as God lives. Don't you remember? And you're walking by him acting like you don't know. You have no idea what lostness is. Or are you walking by and says, yes, well, I can't do anything about it. I don't have the capacity to help anybody. Is anybody hearing me? You would get out of your car and you would spend hours walking through the woods to try to find some kid that you don't even know. But you won't spend 15 minutes trying to pass out a track. But that doesn't take 15 minutes. Is anybody hearing me? I'm telling you, I'm just telling you the purpose of this parable. Jesus is trying to get these bozo religious churchgoers, trying to get them to realize, hey, hey, they're all around us. Do you care? Are you burdened? The old song is still valuable. Let me see this world, dear Lord as though I were looking through your eyes. A world of men who don't want you, Lord, but a world for which you died. Let me kneel with you in the garden. Blur my eyes with tears of agony. For if once I could see this world the way you see, I just know I would serve you more faithfully. Can somebody say amen? Mercy sakes. Well, that's kind of the introduction. I told you I was going to preach mainly about the prodigal today. So here we go. He leaves home. We uh, See his departure. So verse 12 again. The younger son said to his father, give me the portion of the goods that fall with me, and he divided unto him his living. And now many days the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance by his living. These two verses describe in just a few words, watch, what has been the ruin of countless numbers, you could say thousands or maybe millions of people, these two verses. Well, what do you mean? Well, the first step, he's kind of tired of authority. He doesn't want to yield and to surrender to authority that's over him or that has expectation of him. He wants to, you know, be his own boss. Is anybody hearing me? All right, since we're talking about it, we might as well say, look, look, look. It's not just kids who say this. There are grown men that say, I'm tired of the expectations and the responsibility and what's inside this house. I'm going to go somewhere else. That's heartbreaking. And some of you crybaby men will go, well, that's not, that's not really what I meant. That's what you did, or that's what you're thinking about doing. Shaking off responsibility, control, the responsibility is a control on you that you don't want anymore. Excuse me, fellas, it's not just fellas, it's women too. Women have left their responsibility and that contr- the control of that responsibility, saying, I don't want this anymore. Here's what I want. I want what I want. And they leave it. It's not just kids. Their own desires, their own depravity that wants to be satisfied rather than what is right. Now, 
excuse me, let me just take a breath here and let you relax. Some of you are going, well, that's really not what I was expecting today at church. I didn't really come here, I don't think, for that. Well, this is what the guest preacher is preaching today. When you found out it was about the prodigal, you're going, oh, that's going to be a cute story. That would be good. The second step is that he leaves and he finds himself, I love to say it, and you that were here 30, 20, whatever it was, 33 years ago, he's in a far country. Now, means he's a long ways removed from God. G. Campbell Morgan said it like this, please catch this. Everyone, and please catch this. It's a far country, though a step can land you in it. You just hear me? You don't have to be gone from God for three weeks or three months or three years. One step away from God can wind you up in a place you never, ever dreamed you were going to be. Because you thought, yeah, I just want to do what I want to do right now. And all it does is keep leading down a horrible path. Sin is never satisfied with a little bit. It's like a cancer. It wants more of you, more of your heart, more of your mind, more of your life. You go, well, I'm just doing this one little thing here. And sin says, all right, I've got a foothold here. I've got some, I've got a hook on some of these capillaries. I've got a, I've got a hook on some of these little conduit in the brain. All right, then and it just begins to take over more and more and more. When lust has conceived and it bringeth forth sin, and when sin it is finished, bringeth forth death. Ladies and gentlemen, don't act like you can just take a step or one little bit no, 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 no. We've got to be on guard all the time. The downward spiral has begun. The Bible says he wasted his substance with riotous living. He used it up. It's gone. Um, Strong's help with the word riotous is immoral. It's shameless living. It's reckless, it's extravagant. He just had money and he had a party, he had, had a great time. G. Campbell Morgan again said it like this. Listen to how he describes me in here. He said, we madly plunge deeper into the mud in hopes of finding the pearl which has eluded us. All our lives. In God's pursuit, He has ability, He has grace, He has love, He has mercy. Watch. In God's pursuit of us, has the ability to bring about circumstances that get our attention where maybe, maybe we'll wake up and come to ourselves. Did you just hear me? God loves you so much that you might find yourself in a famine. Everything's all used up. No, 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 no. I, 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 I love to tell people all the time that are not saved, and, and if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I can tell you why you're here. It's because God is pursuing you. Amen. He loves you so much. He's after you. And God could, his pursuit could include a famine. His pursuit could include the loss of all money. His pursuit could include that everybody's turned their back on you. Whatever it is, ladies and gentlemen, God is still after you. He's interested in you. He's trying to get you to the place where you'll, the Bible says, come to. 
Look what he does in verse 15 and 16. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he, the boss, sent him into the field to feed pigs, to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk of the swine that he, no one gave to him. Mercy. When the Bible says he joined himself, Mr. Strong's again helps me with this. He says uh, that it's like that he attached himself. He like glued himself. He's like forced himself upon this guy that he doesn't even know, a stranger. And he says, please, I don't have any food. I don't have any money. I don't have any friends. I just need, I need just, just let me do something. Let me do anything just so I can get some food here. And he goes, okay, go feed the pigs. Wow. I don't know if you're getting this or not. What he's doing, he could no longer make it on his own. He became dependent on somebody else to help take care of him. I know, I already know, this is so obvious. All of you are okay. You can make it on your own. But God brought him to a place where he couldn't. When it says he feigned, it means he has this longing desire. He's looking at the food that the pigs are eating. He's going, I'm pretty sure I could eat this. And it's called husk. These husk things. And I did the research, and I know you don't care, but since I'm the one speaking, there's these little gelatin, or they're little um, oh, pods, and they're long, like almost my picture in my brain is almost uh, uh, like okra. It's a little long pod like that. It's kind of filled with a gelatin type thing. And uh, in the German, it was called Bachstornbaum. It's this little horn thing that comes off the Bachstornbaum tree and so on. And so it, it's perhaps that it's something like that. And he's looking at the food that the pigs are eating. He goes, I'm ready and to eat this too. And then, hallelujah, verse 17, and when he came to. He understands where he is. He understands and he recognizes his condition. He recognizes the results of his rebellion against his father. Watch, he has nothing. He has no future. He's about to eat pig food. Watch, he realizes, I'm going to need help if I'm going to get out of this mess. Well, I don't know. He's gone so far down, he, he can't do it on his own. See, much of humanity thinks we can all do it on our own. I can figure out a way. I'll pull myself up. I'll get myself together. Listen carefully. He feels dirty. And he is. He feels guilty. And he is. He feels embarrassed. And he is. He feels shameful. And he is. He feels broken. And he is. He feels unworthy. And he is. He realizes that his father has all these resources. He knows that his father is benevolent. His father is kind. His father is forgiving. His father never wanted him to leave in the first place. And his father takes care of all those under his wing. And he comes to, watch this, he comes to the end of himself. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Ladies and gentlemen, his humility is apparent. He's not saying, hey, I'm your son. Let me come back. He said, I don't deserve to be your son. Just let me be a servant. He's at the end of his own ways, his own ideas, his own desires. He's realized, I can't do it. If I get out of this, it's going to have to be, he's going to have to let me come back. 
and forgive me. I love this. I love this. He's willing right now. We're reading it. He's willing to humble himself publicly. He doesn't care who's in the building. He doesn't care who's in the field. He doesn't care who's around. He doesn't care who sees him walking up the road. He doesn't care what others think anymore. He's at the end of himself. He realizes it's, it's his sin. And he's willing to confess his sin. Realizing his sin is before heaven and earth. Did you hear what he said? I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. It doesn't matter who sees it. It doesn't matter what others think. I don't know if you're getting this or not. Please catch this. This is what repentance looks like. True repentance is not making a deal. True repentance, repentance is real. I can't do it. I don't have any hope. Well, re repentance doesn't go, well, I wonder who's watching. Repentance, no one else is in the, and no one's in the area. It's just you and the Father. You're coming to him. That's true repentance, folks. When you finally get over yourself. He comes home with no strings attached. No expectations. I'm willing, I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to be one of the slaves, the servant. I'm willing to, I'll, be, I'll submit to anything. There's nothing off the table here. There's not demanding, no expectations. I don't expect to be in the big house. Watch. I'm willing to part with all that behind me. It's all lost. I don't need to bring any of that with me. I'm just coming, coming to you with nothing. I think this is fascinating, and I think I, I'm just glad that it was pointed out. The Lord pointed out to me, verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, "How many hired servants of my father's house are having enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy." And it's on. And watch, watch, watch. In verse 17, when he said, I will arise and go to my father and say, I've sinned. I think that's appropriate. I think it's very important that you come to the end of yourself like that. Listen carefully. There's a lot of people that say it and they even know it but they never do it. Just because he's ready to leave the pig farm and he goes, I'm going to arise and go to my father. I'm going to do this tomorrow. Yeah, there's lots of people that are saying tomorrow. Another day. And they are in the same condition as this prodigal son. And they know it's a mess, and there's no way out except by help from the Father. And they say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it another time. I'll do it when I'm ready. You're, you're, you cannot make any conditions on this, friend. <laughs> Did he do it? More than just say it? Well, glory to God. Yes, he did. Verse 20. And he arose. Somebody say amen. He arose and came to his father. <laughs> but when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Ladies and gentlemen, in the scriptures, in Jesus' parable here, he talks about the father and he's talking about this condition and the father represents God. That's what this is about, that God is interested in the lost, the helpless, the worthless, the needy, and the father. Watch what the Bible says. When the father saw him a great way off, the whole time God is waiting for the lost to realize they're lost and not just say they're lost, but come, come to him. And nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible we ever find that God runs 
He doesn't really have to, does he? He's everywhere at the same time. However, in Jesus' parable, the only time that you can find God running is when the, when the sinner comes home. When the sinner turns to him, God takes off running. Mercy. Friend, that's how much God loves you. That's how much he's waiting for you. But you've got to come to the end of yourself. As long as you think you're good enough, as long as you think you're religious enough, as long as you made a good deal with God, you're fine. Though, though, none of those will work. You've got to come to God empty-handed. You have nothing to offer him. You have no expectations. Just let me be one of your servants. Wow. Here's what I'll go ahead and say. He believed. Well, how do you, how do you know he believed? Because he did it. That's what faith is. Faith is action. Faith is not sitting in the, on the recliner or sitting in the pew going, yeah, I should get right with God. Yeah, I need to do that. I'm going to do it sometime. I'm going to do it soon. I need to take care of this. That's not faith. Faith is when you take the step and say, okay, God, I'm coming home. Amen. Yes, he believed. Praise God. And we do know. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Shoes on his feet. Bring the hither of the cast. And kill it. Let's eat. Be merry. For this my son was dead. He's alive. He's lost and found. They began to be merry. Ladies and gentlemen, the father said yes to him and brought him in. I love this. He didn't put him on probation. All right. Are you, we're going to wait a while. Keep an eye on you. When you come to God in faith, here's the deal. He knows when you have faith or not. He knows when you're making a deal with him. He knows when you've got your own ideas. But when you come with nothing, no expectations, just saying, God, I can't fix this. I need some help. I can't save me. I have nothing to offer you. I just want to be one of your servants. Wow. If you're not saved today, it is quite the painting how much God loves you. It's amazing that he cares this much for you, that he's given you another day of breath, another opportunity actually in a church building that he would, he would be that gracious to you to say, I want to save you. I want to forgive your sin. No, 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 not in your way, not on your terms, but I will forgive your sin if you'll come to me by faith. Wow. Just because, you, just, come on. just because you're sitting in this building don't mean you get to go to heaven, friend. You need to be sure you're saved. Now, we can flip this around, and it is applicable you're saved, and you know it. But you, too, have taken a step away from God. And it's amazing that God would be willing to say, get back over here, get back home where you belong. That he would say it to us that are saved. We're born again. He's given us everything that, I love what the, uh, they said in Sunday school, that he's given us everything that belongs to Christ till we get to heaven. And then we make a choice to step away from him. And he's saying, come home, come back home. You know it, he knows it. You and I can deny it, we can brush it off, we can try to bury it. But you and I, I should say it like this, me and God know where I am. You and God know where you are.